Hi, I'm Delaney McKenzie, and I wanted to talk a little bit about trying to model the outcome of World Cup games and how that relates back to finance. So, when you're thinking about modeling the outcome of a sports event, uh, you can think about it in a variety of different ways. Uh, at the end of the day, you could go full deterministic physics and try to model the prediction of uh, model the location of like every single atom in the pitch and every single atom in the player's brains and bodies and try to determine you know what the state of the match will be after the match is over but there's a lot of debate amongst physicists about whether or not you can even do that so uh, we're going to ignore that approach for now and we're going to go back to some more canonical modeling approaches such as trying to look at maybe the historical outcomes of when different teams have played each other and um, there's a fundamental problem with this, and there's a fundamental problem in general in statistics, which is that the state that we're trying to measure when we're looking at systems uh, is often not stationary. And what, I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, the state of systems can change over time. And so in soccer, what would that mean? Or football. Uh, but in soccer, what would that mean? Well, uh, that would mean that uh, maybe a team changes over time because they hire or fire players. Maybe there's injuries that cause a team to change over time or exogenous shocks or differences in coaching style or strategy. So the state that you're trying to measure, which is effectively how likely is one team to beat another team, um, may not be stationary, it may change over time. And uh, the likelihood of, let's say, Brazil to beat Germany um, is definitely different from the likelihood of Argentina to beat Germany. And what's more, it's not fully transitive. So if you look at the likelihood of Brazil to beat Germany and the likelihood of Argentina to beat Germany and the likelihood of Argentina to beat Brazil, well, you're not gonna get this nice ranking. Uh, there's actually going to be a lot of, you know, inequalities basically where um, you get these cycles where maybe like three teams are more likely to beat each other in a, in a little cycle. And the reason for that is because a lot of things come down to style of teams. And because of the way that Brazil plays, they may, may be more or less likely to beat Germany. And Argentina will have a different set of reasons as to why they're more or less likely to beat Germany. So if we're just looking at the results of historical matches, we can run into some problems pretty quickly. So let's say that we looked at all of the times that Brazil has played Germany in the past four years. Well, like I said, the team that Brazil is today may be very different from the team that Brazil was four years ago. So it may not be meaningful to look at the results of Brazil versus Germany four years ago and try to incorporate that into your model. Uh, and Moreover, you actually have a very small sample size at the end of the day. Um, you don't have a ton of games on which you can base the results of, uh, of your predictions. Um, and this is a very common thing uh, in general in statistics, which is that if you have a process which samples infrequently, you don't have all that much data. And you can think of each game as basically sampling uh, the state of two different teams by putting them against each other and seeing you know, which one happens to win in that case. Uh, and uh, when you have so few sample points, you're really not going to be able to establish a good signal to noise ratio. So um, in general, to create a predictive model, you need to find something that has a good signal to noise ratio. So how could we do that? Uh, the most uh, you know, frequent and common approach is going to be we're going to try to sample more. And how are we going to sample more in this case? Well, we can't get teams to play each other more. We can't just like run experiments. But what we can do maybe is look deeper beyond just a single game outcome. So let's try to look more into a game. What are some events that we could look at in a game? Well, we could look at each individual player and model that player's skill. Um, maybe we could look at the number of shots that a team makes and the percentage of the shots that convert to goals to try to measure kind of a, an offensive score and whether or not they're better at shooting or better at actually converting shots into goals or maybe both. Um, and it turns out that there's actually a huge amount of data that's collected on this and uh, 538 uh, actually does a lot of really good pieces that cover this type of data, so I'd encourage you to check them out if you want to learn more. Um, but there's a huge amount of data on where the ball is, the position of all the different players, and you can actually, from that data, basically pull out a huge amount of uh, statistics on individual players, on team styles and strategies, and construct much more sophisticated models uh, about um, you know, whether or not a team is likely to beat another team. So let's relate this back to finance because this is actually a really common uh, problem in statistics and quantitative finance. 
When you're thinking about a system, you're trying to measure the state of a system, or you're trying to estimate the state of a system, and the state of a system may not be stationary. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, just like with soccer, how a team can change over time due to a variety of events, uh, the state of any system can change over time. And uh, if you're trying to measure, for instance, the temperature of the globe on average, that's currently changing. So if you measured it now, it's not going to tell you a huge amount about what it might be uh, tomorrow or the next day or the next day. You have to incorporate information about the fact that it's changing. And in general, the faster that the underlying state of a system changes, the faster that you have to sample in order to get a good sense of what that system state is at this point in time and try to predict what its state might be in the future. So an example of this might be thinking about a slow strategy that uses uh, fundamental data and rebalances its books maybe once a quarter. Now, if the strategy does this uh, once a quarter, you're only going to have effectively like 40 rebalancing events over 10 years. That's really not very much. The strategy's performance 10 years ago may have no impact on its performance right now. And it's very difficult to get a sense of how that strategy might perform next year because you only have four sample points from the most recent market regime, from the most recent, you know, basically like amount of alpha incorporating alpha decay. And so how might you try to get more information about how that strategy is going to perform next year? Well, you have to sample faster. And in some cases, that's very difficult. In some cases, you can't really get more data. Um, in the case of soccer, you can, which is good. But at the end of the day, when you're trying to measure the underlying state of a process, just remember that you have to be sampling at a much higher multiple of the frequency at which the state changes in order to get information about the state and incorporate that back into your models.